Now that the NHL has resolved the Evgeny Dadanov trade situation between the Ducks and the Golden Knights, will he still be traded elsewhere? We'll discuss how those possibilities could work. Plus, could we see a major trade between the Sens and the Habs in the offseason? Will Claude Drew venture back home to Ottawa as a UFA? Plus, we have lots of news on the NHL GM meetings that are coming up, what they're going to be discussing, which includes some major rule changes and an update on the salary cap. All that and more coming up next. Welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have all kinds of NHL news and rumors to discuss here today. Let's start with the upcoming uh, general managers meetings next week. They have a lot to discuss, including some pretty potential significant rule changes. One of the items on the discussion board is going to be the potential closing of the LTIR rule, which allows players like we saw Kucherov last year return in the playoffs, etc. Essentially what the potential solution is, which I've mentioned myself before, would be super easy. Uh, for them to get rid of this LTIR issue would be to have the salary cap still be imposed during the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's just that simple. Currently, right now, the salary cap only applies and pertains to the NHL regular season. As soon as that season is over, the playoffs begin. They don't have to be cap compliant anymore. So if players magically return from injury after being out for a significant period of time on game one, like we saw with Kucherov, it's legal. We can all complain about it all we want. There's nothing that can be done about it unless that rule is changed. Now, we don't know exactly how big of a group, but apparently uh, Pierre Lebron on Insider Trading was saying that there's already been um, a, a decent-sized group of NHL general managers been discussing this situation for about the last three to four weeks, uh, and they've brought it to the league's attention and had, tried, wanted to have it added uh, to the uh, topics to be discussed at the upcoming GM meetings to see how the rest of their colleagues feel about this. Of course, we know uh, with, the, with the Kucherov situation, we saw it with Patrick Kane back in 2015. Uh, we saw a situation just here in the last couple of days with the whole Vegas Golden Knights dead and off deal. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but they're in a major heap of trouble with their salary cap, trying to bring in an LTIR contract, uh, you know, to become cap compliant. And obviously Mark Stone might not be able to come back to the playoffs, but if, can you imagine if that rule was in place today, Vegas's salary cap situation would be way more significant than it actually appears to be right now. If they could survive to the end of the regular season, qualify for the playoffs, they could bring everybody back. But that would not be so easy if this rule is indeed changed. So we we'll certainly expect a, a lengthy discussion. I'm not sure how many GMs are going to be in favor of it or not. I know Tampa apparently was one of the teams in favor of changing it before when it was last discussed, which was a number of years ago. Um, and of course, they ended up using it to their advantage uh, to win the back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. But still, like I said, many of us can be upset about how the rule works and whatever, but it's, it's totally legal and, and it is what it is. So uh, we'll see where those discussions go. Now, of course, we also get word that the salary cap is still expected to rise a million dollars. Revenues are still uh, you know, on pace to meet what they had expected. So for the first time in three years, we should see a small bump in salary cap, which isn't going to be much, but they had projected a million dollar increase for a few years until they can do a more significant increase, hopefully a couple of years down the road. Uh, but at least that'll be a little bit of relief. It's not going to be a lot, but every little bit will help. So we will see where things go. Uh, of course, another rule that's likely going to be heavily discussed here at the GM meetings is to help with the dead knob situation that we just seen again. So how no trade clause lists are handled in uh, where they're housed in a, a database of some sort or whatever. Right now, as we talked about when the, the whole situation with that deal, there seems to be a lot of finger pointing on who was at fault. But right now, if the NHL had uh, some kind of central database or some sort where these lists of players that uh, teams that they're blocking for trades or whatever was uh, you know handled by the league or the, or the PA in some capacity, then it wouldn't just be the teams on the hook and you would eliminate a lot of that uh, from ever happening again because clearly this was a big issue. Regardless of who was at fault, when you could say Vegas tried to pull a fast one on the league, you could say that when the trade between Ottawa and Vegas took place that the information wasn't transferred, wasn't provided. I don't know if there was miscommunication. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day who was at fault in that case because if there was a, a league or a PA office where all the stuff was stored and confidentially, of course, that you know the central registry people could refer to when trades were being uh, completed, 
this wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't be all on the team. So obviously the uh, the list would come from players and their agents. They could send a copy to the league, to the PA, or whoever is going to look after that, as well as the team, so they have a copy. And just keep it at that simple so that we don't see any additional situations happen like we saw here right at the nick of the deadline here uh, on Monday. And of course, you know, I'm sure that's going to create a really awkward scenario between Evgeny Dadnov and the Vegas Golden Knights. And while we're on it, could he still be traded? Is it likely going to happen? The answer is yes, it could. Is it likely? I think it's it's decent. I don't know how likely, but I certainly know, based on what we've heard from NHL reporters, which makes a lot of sense, that there's some teams with cap space, like the Coyotes, for example. You could probably throw in teams like Detroit, Ottawa, Buffalo, to an extent. Looking at this, kind of licking their chops a little bit, saying... Not only would they be willing to take Dadden off, it's not even so much that they really love him as a player. They don't have to because it's only one more year uh, under contract, but it's what they can extort out of Vegas for taking it on. So, you know, throw in your first round pick, throw in a pretty good prospect. I'll take those two items for taking on one year of his contract. So essentially that very well could happen. And if Vegas is in a spot now where their, their roster is pretty frozen, they can't bring back Alec Martinez. They can't bring back Mark Stone. They're not guaranteed in the playoffs. They're sitting on the outside looking in. They don't have a great schedule. Like they're, you know, by points percentage, like they're out a little bit here. I, I don't know what they're going to do, but it wouldn't shock me if they did move a player or two to a team with cap space. Now, what would happen in that scenario is that player, if he is traded, his season comes to a whole cold stop and he's, he's done. He's not eligible to be playing anymore, but it would give them the relief that they need to try to get into the playoffs. So we'll see what happens, but it very well could happen. And I would not be surprised if the Coyotes, who do currently have enough space to squeeze Dadnoff in, trying to extort some extra resources. It gets them a player under contract for next year, which we know they're looking for. Uh, it kept, helps keep them closer to the salary cap floor, which we know they're looking for. And it can help get them some assets for the rebuild, which we also know that they're looking for. So there's a lot of pros there for Arizona to uh, be calling out Vegas saying, hey, did you want to try this again? We can probably help you out and do you a solid here. So we'll see what happens, but it wouldn't be shocking if that comes about. Uh, some news from the IIHF. We uh, had reports today that the International Ice Hockey Federation has referred the Russian Ice Hockey Federation to the uh, ethics board. So they're being investigated. Uh, basically, the Russian um, Ice Hockey Federation is being accused of sending instructions to the KHL team teams to make demonstrations or actions to be uh, supportive of the war and invasion of Ukraine. So obviously that goes against a lot of ethics, you know, to be pro-war is not something that's kindly looked upon by many, of course, which makes total sense. Uh, so there's that. But the other thing that's interesting here is that former IIHF president, Rene Fassel, who's also considered uh, a lifetime president. So he's kind of like, you know, one of those situations where you see a, a president kind of move into more of an advisory kind of role, considered a lifetime president, has recently taken on a, uh, a job working with the KHL. We know that he's close with Putin. He's close with the Russian Ice Hockey Federation people. And uh, he's now personally under investigation himself uh, for the uh, same sort of scenario, but for also making remarks that appeared to be pro-Russian invasion and pro-war. So um, we'll see what comes about from that. I'm not sure what kind of sanctions, penalties. I, I don't know what will come from it, but certainly, uh, you know, more... Uh, negative uh, press for them, which is not a huge shock. I know a lot of people have been talking in the uh, international ice hockey scene about Rene Vassell. Um, I know uh, that, that obviously because of his relationships, it's certainly uh, kind of caused a lot of people to kind of change their opinion of him here as of recently. So we'll see where things go. And once we get an update on that situation, uh, we'll discuss it further here on the channel. Uh, a couple of the quick updates we've seen here between some injuries and waivers. Uh, we saw Christian Yeros actually be placed and clear unconditional waivers with New Jersey. So he's contract termination is complete. So essentially wasn't happy with the opportunity uh, and he's free to sign wherever else he may go. So whether or not that's another NHL, AHL, European team or whatever he wants to do, he's completely a free agent right now. 
Of course, we saw the Leafs try to sign to bring it over Harry Satiri, goaltender from the KHL, and he was claimed, which we talked about a few days ago, by the Arizona Coyotes. But further information that we've learned through the 32 Thoughts podcast and Elliot Friedman saying that there was actually quite a few teams that put a claim in. It's believed there's as many as five teams put in a claim. So, of course, when that happens, they go by whoever's lowest in the NHL standing. So the Coyotes obviously have most teams beat in that regard. So they get the claim successfully there. But in the case of a lot of these GMs, according to Friedman, some of them wanted to do it basically just a mess with Toronto because clearly we've seen the Leafs lose a lot of players on waivers. We know they're a strong hockey club trying to bring in a player last minute to help shore up their goaltending situation. And uh, Friedman said he talked to one GM, said we're not going to put in a claim, but I sure hope a lot of other teams do. So obviously Kyle Dewis went on record saying about how many players he's lost on waivers compared to other clubs. It's about double in the last couple of years. Um, but you know what? Uh, that's because of their cap situation and how they've decided to manage their roster. It's just the nature of how things go. I mean, for the most part, they haven't lost anything too significant, but it certainly creates some issues here for sure. Now, we also have some injuries as well, including Jonas Corpusalo's done for the season. Uh, and having some hip surgery, which explains why he wasn't traded. Uh, obviously, a lot of people suspected him to go as a goaltending uh, depth piece at the deadline. Islanders also have a couple significant injuries. Players that are likely done for the year, including Cal Clutterbuck and Scott Mayfield. Cal Clutterbuck apparently he requires shoulder surgery, so he's done for sure. Mayfield is estimated to be out about a month, possibly as long as six weeks. So if that's the case, he's likely done as well with a lower body injury now another quick player update as well that was not traded was phil kessel uh, many expected him to be dealt because he's been looking for a trade out of arizona all year uh, according to elliot friedman the main thing which actually does make sense is that there really wasn't a lot of significant interest but of course anybody who kind of did show any interest would only want to do it at 50 percent retained salary at best uh, and the problem here is arizona with a lot of their other trades, had already retained salary in other files. You are allowed a maximum of three files that you can have retained salary on at any given time. And once they completed the Johan Larson trade uh, and they did retain salary there, that pretty much eliminated the possibility from doing it for Kessel, which eliminated any team taking on that big cap hit. So there was some interest, but it wasn't as much as you'd think, but explains why he didn't get moved either. And then lastly, another uh, couple of tidbits here from the uh, from the 32 Thoughts pod and uh, recent uh, blog here from Elliot Freeman talking about all of, both of these are linked to Ottawa here. Could we see Claude Giroux go to Ottawa as a UFA in the summertime? We know we just saw a big trade for him to go to the Florida Panthers. You know what? We don't know. Maybe he'll really like it there, have a lot of success, and maybe he'll want to sign even though it might have to be a cheap contract to fit their cap situation. Hard to say, but he indicated that Giroux has been doing some investigating to kind of figure out, uh, you know, if maybe going to Ottawa might be an option. I don't know if there's mutual interest. It's believed there would be, of course. I know uh, Giroux obviously spends a lot of time there in the summer. He's from the area not far away. His, his, I believe his wife's also from Canada as well, which they have a lot of family in the area. I know the last time I talked about Drew in the channel and talked about, well, talked about like him being from Ottawa. I had a couple of people comment saying he's not from Ottawa. Uh, yes, he is actually. If you look up, if you just look up, if you don't know anything about him and you look at Wikipedia or where he's born, it's going to say a different location in Ontario, but he did move to the Ottawa area when he was fairly young, spent a lot of his uh, you know minor hockey days there before graduating into junior and moving on to to the NHL and he does spend a lot of time in that area in the summertime like I said his wife's from uh, the area too so it would make a lot of sense if he really wants to play at home it's something that's been rumored for a long time that he's had interest in that towards the end of his career if the uh, opportunity was right that it was something he would want to do we'll see I think a lot of it will probably be determined by if he gets that Stanley Cup this offseason or not like if he you know ends the summer with a cup then he might not be so keen on, you know, going for another one. He might be more inclined to want to play at home. But if he doesn't get that Stanley Cup, he's not going to probably be getting it in Ottawa over the next year or two. So I don't know what kind of contract he'd be looking for, but he would be a good fit. He'd be a good pro to bring in because that's something they've struggled with to surround their young players with some good pro, you know, uh, well-experienced, you know, good quality players and that's uh would be a, a long way i think to helping the team take another step but we'll see uh we'll see if freeman's on to something on that one and the other thing we mentioned here too is that could we see a significant trade between the senators and the Habs? now apparently there was a lot of negotiations going on and according to Friedman's sources a lot of people thought it was going to come to be it was going to happen here at the nhl trade deadline but it fell through 
not near the end for whatever reason, And but he does expect those talks to resume in the offseason and wouldn't be shocked if the deal was completed at that point. Now, apparently the main player on the Ottawa side of things was Colin White. We don't really know. He didn't say a lot about what the return package was, but the connection here is that Colin White's former agent is Ken Hughes, so there's a relationship there. Knows him extremely well. We know Montreal is rebuilding, looking for some younger players. Uh, maybe he feels White would be a better fit compared to somebody else. Uh, based on Sen's uh, Twitter, which I know uh, there's a lot of chatter about this amongst Sen's fans on what the return could be, what the trade could be, and I know many were convinced it would likely be a Josh Anderson return. Now, I don't know if that would be the case. Uh, both players are signed longer term. Anderson's a little bit older, but not drastically. Um, giving you similar offensive totals. Very different players, though. I mean, I could see Anderson being a decent fit in Ottawa at the same time. I don't know exactly what they were discussing. I wouldn't be completely shocked if Ottawa was asking about Jake Allen in some degree, given the uncertainty in their goaltending situation. But again, can't confirm that. We don't know exactly. There could have been other pieces on either side possibly included there. But uh, certainly, you know, division rivals, they're only two hours apart. Uh, teams that we've seen make trades before, but nothing you know crazy significant. But something like that would be a, a pretty major swap and would be interesting to see in the offseason. But uh, obviously with the connection there of White to Hughes, wouldn't be surprised if talks do get revisited and we do see a substantial trade. Now, we've already heard rumors about other players as soon as Kent Hughes became GM of the Habs, including Patrice Bergeron, Chris Letang, who are also going to be UFAs this offseason, former clients of his as well. Would they want to go back to their home province of Quebec and consider joining the Habs? I don't know if that makes sense. You're probably going to hear a lot of rumors about a lot of his former clients linked to him. Some might make more sense than others, and uh, we'll see. Now, another name besides Anderson to me that would possibly make sense might be Christian Dvorak. We know that they weren't overly thrilled with how he fit, but at the same time, there's a lot of you know different circumstances and where the team was at. I don't know if they would consider that, but obviously White normally plays center but can play wing. Maybe they want to swap centers. I'm not really sure, but hard to say what was being discussed, but stay tuned for a potential major trade between those division rivals closer to the NHL draft. So that's all your news and updates here for now. So certainly stay tuned uh, to the channel if you're new. Make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.